Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 14, Episode 89. He's Dave Bryan. I'm Alex Kazora, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being back with us here this Monday, Steelers Nation. Dave, the final football game of the 2023-2024 season is in the book. Super Bowl 58, concluding Sunday night in Las Vegas. And the Kansas City Chiefs are world champions yet again, beating the San Francisco 49ers 25-22 to in overtime, taking every second of that overtime period. McCall Harbin, three-yard touchdown catch to win it for the Chiefs. And so uh, you kind of talked about this pre-show, slow start, great finish, and all good Super Bowls should have a great finish, and this one certainly did. Yeah, it did. Uh, the second half was a lot more entertaining, obviously, than the first half uh, there. But uh, I think one of the uh, huge takeaways uh, when you look back at this and then you look at uh, our, our, our pregame kind of a quick analysis that we did on the Friday show and all, uh, advanced analytics are fantastic. Uh, they're not going away. Uh, they give you great uh, overviews of long sections, uh, uh, long spans of games. Uh, but when it boils down to it, you still have to play one single single game and anything obviously can happen. Uh, anything can be an outlier, not that Patrick Mahomes uh, uh, getting the ball last and driving the field for a game winning uh, Super Bowl is an outlier. But what the funny thing is, I think if you roll back and you listen to that uh, that show and my reasoning of ending up with the 49ers the way I did. Everything that I talked about <laughs> initially of why I started off with 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 thinking the Chiefs would win this uh, before involving advanced analytics is actually what happened. Uh, mm-hmm. pa- Patrick Mahomes' experience. How dare you bet against Patrick Mahomes? Uh, Steve Spagnolia uh, di- dialed up uh, pressures at all the right perfect times it seems in that game uh the chiefs defense uh in 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 key moments in that game uh played an important important part uh one thing we really didn't highlight but we highlight several times throughout the uh the season special teams matters Mm -hmm. uh and it certainly did on 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 one of those uh the muff punt there that the uh the chiefs late in the what was it i guess the third quarter that they ended up turning into a a, 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 a touchdown there uh but yeah look i mean over t- entertaining overall and the, and the, my main takeaway and i think i've done this two years in a row now with the super bowl is don't you dare bet against <laughs> patrick mahomes that's 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 the huge takeaway here you can have all the analytics you want when it's Mahomes. You take Mahomes in a big game, and he'll prove you right 95% of the time. I'm with you, Dave. Um, great defensive battle, big plays on special teams, punt coverage, 55-plus you know, yard field goals. Mm. My takeaway from this game, though, is just in those – because every game comes down to a couple of plays. You know, you go back and forth, you're evenly matched in games like this, two really strong teams, the Niners and the Chiefs. And what what happens in those weighty moments, those got-to-have-it moments, when it's fourth and a half yard, the Super Bowl literally on the line, and the Chiefs style up their best play, three options for Mahomes to give the ball to the back or run it as he did or throw it to Kelsey in the flat or if it's third down, get the ball to Kelsey, your best player, isolate him and hit him for a big play. Um, defensively, that that – nickel blitz that McDuffie had to bat down that pass by Purdy late in the fourth quarter to force the field goal, give the Chiefs time to get the ball back and go down there and tie the game up. Um, to me, that's situational football. And the Chiefs were just so good in those got to have moments. They had the perfect call in perfect big-time moments, and that won them a Super Bowl. And, you know, there were several times throughout that game where you kind of wondered if Andy Reid might be getting out coached a little bit. A couple of those spots, you know, were, were horrible spots and I thought maybe should have been challenged uh, along the way. And, 
but uh, you know they they hung. And, but look, his play calling and 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 what what they did offensively was obviously even though if I guess if you look overall at, at the overall uh, uh, you know stats of the game, you know they just. They just stayed to kind of who they were and, mm-hmm. and and hung around, and you get into that second half there, and once once Mahomes heated up, and you know you obviously you had the mobility of Mahomes that played a, a big factor uh, 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 late in the game there, and man, you got it got it to a situation in overtime, you know, uh, Mahomes took over. I mean, uh, Mahomes did what he's been known to do with his feet and with his arm. And then, as you mentioned, in 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 the weighty moments there, uh, they made the plays uh, that 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 mattered the most there. So, uh, I don't know. I mean, do you have anything else to add about the game? I, mean, I think field goal kicking, wow! So, and, and the missed extra point uh, in in, yeah. in in the game, you had the uh, you had the 49ers making some key key uh, plays on special teams that you thought would be, man, there was a point in this game where you kind of wondered, was Chris Conley going to be <laughs> uh, the Super Bowl MVP? And then uh, uh, you, you, as the game went along, you kind of wonder if, if, if Jawan Jennings might be the MVP there. So there were, there was enough shifts in this game as it went along. It was almost like kind of watching, I guess, three games uh, in, in one and, and because of the closeness of it, because of, uh, it going to overtime, it, it ended up being an entertaining, uh, entertaining Super Bowl overall. Oh yeah. An all timer really just based on never had a game go this long in the Super Bowl in overtime right. like this down to, to the final play of the first overtime. Two more thoughts here. And speaking of overtime, a lot of controversy, the Niners electing to receive in overtime and with the, the new playoff overtime rules where you know, both teams basically are almost guaranteed a possession unless it was a defensive score and that, that opening possession um why would the Niners choose to receive the football it's better to to kick and then you know what you have to do on the second drive as Chiefs did when they knew to go for it on fourth down um because the Niners you know kicked the field goal in their first possession so it felt like maybe there was some uh inexperience obviously to handling this overtime situation in the postseason for San Francisco yeah, I'm, I'm, that's already the big talk uh, on this Monday morning here, and you can, you can, I guess, understand why. Uh, you, it's like you kind of said, it's, it's kind of like college. You want to know what you have to match, right? You know, uh, and obviously the 49ers went down and 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 got the field goal in, on their first possession. And at that point, uh, the Chiefs know exactly what they're up against. That you know, at that point, they at 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 worst need a field goal. Uh, and obviously, if they get into a fourth down situation, they know they have to go for it. And uh, yeah, it it made for a curious uh, decision on the 49ers part. And uh, yeah, I imagine that's going to be talked about beginning of this week quite a bit. I know Kyle Shannon said post game their logic was analytics based, but also they wanted the ball third. So their thought was, okay, if it if they get the if they kick a field goal and say the Chiefs kick a field goal, then what next score wins? And if the Niners have that opportunity, they can end the game right there. But I think you'd rather have the ball second and, and know the situation as opposed to maybe, but having a slimmer chance of you know both teams matching possessions, outcomes, the first two drives, and then you get the ball third to try to to go win it. I don't think that's worth, um, you know, receiving to, to start over time. My other thought as well is, and you, may, you kind of made mention of this earlier. I mean, that first quarter, it was all 49ers. They dominated. I mean, the chiefs had nothing. They had like 16 yards of offense. The Niners are winning the line of scrimmage offensively and defensively pile moving forward with their run game. They just beat themselves. They couldn't finish McCaffrey, a huge opening possession fumble. Uh, you know, it was 10, nothing. It should have been 14, nothing, 17, nothing. And you said the phrase, you know, let Mahomes hang around. And that right. is a, a death sentence. You cannot let Patrick Mahomes just hang around. He's not going to just hang around for too long. Eventually, he's going to get you. And the turnovers were, were critical in this one. 2-2 two, two in the turnover battle. You got to beat Mahomes and the Chiefs in the turnover battle to have a chance to win. They did not. They were even. And again, that first quarter, that should have been 17 nothing, not 10 nothing, And it cost them. And even though the turnovers were even in this game, the Chiefs capitalized 
uh, on one of them, whereas I don't think the 49ers did, right? Uh, the, uh, after the muff punt, the Chiefs turned that one into a touchdown, mm-hmm. and I don't believe the 49ers came away w- uh, with, with any points on any, any of their takeaways in the game. I don't think I forget what happened after the Mahomes interception. I know uh, after, they, after went the three in, they went three and out. Okay. Yeah, that's huge right there. So that, that's a huge difference as well. The, the, the putos, as you say, right? The points right. on for turnovers. Right. And the fumble in the, uh, in, 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 in the first half uh, that the 49ers caused, they went four and out on that. So you got to take advantage of, of those takeaways, especially when you got somebody like Mahomes on the other side of there. And uh, yeah, Mahomes happens, man. I mean, we're, we're you, you come out of that age that those long stretch of years there when it seemed like uh, for how many years in a row it was either Brady or Manning or Roethlisberger or, you know, you had a, 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 a small sector of quarterbacks that one of those guys was mm-hmm. w- winning the Super Bowl, right? Uh and now we're transitioning into, I mean, Mah- 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 it's not like Mahomes is an old man yet either. And hey, here's the thing. Throughout the season, you, you, you kept looking at, at the Chiefs and, man, when is their offense going to come alive? And do they have the wide receivers? Right. You know, do they have the wide receivers to, to get done what they want to get done on offense? And Mahomes, you know, average uh, or adjusted uh, net yards for Per, t- uh, per attempt stat was down there in the six and they just never could get, you know, things going consistently like you had seen in the past, pass through the air, but yet, you know, MVS had, had, had a, you know, obviously a huge play in this game. Miko Harmon, you know, guys that I think five years ago, um, five years from now, you're going to be going who? You know, they mm-hmm. they're able to win with the who's, you know, uh, uh, kind of guys there because they have Mahomes. Right. Because they have Patrick Mahomes and you found Kelsey in big moments in the second half. He had one catch in the first half. He had eight in the second half for a bunch of yardage and huge plays for sure. Again, weighty moments, third down, crossing routes, isolate him, just really strong play calls to get the ball to the to your best player in the game's biggest moments. That's football one on one. That's what every team seeks to do some accomplish it better than others and no one does it better than the chiefs the question i think becomes you know big picture i know it's a little in the moment but you know three super bowls for Mahomes. what now two mvps i believe where is he ranking in terms of the greatest quarterbacks of all time i mean the resume at 28 dude's 28 and the resume that he has is about as good as you're going to find of any player in nfl history at his current age and stage of his career i mean is there any doubt now i mean he's a hall of famer right Oh yeah, there should be. There's, there's no question. It becomes where does he rank? Is he a top five quarterback of all time already? I think he'll get there if he's not there already, but by the end of his career. But I mean, it, I think it's a. It's now become a valid discussion. Right. It, it really has. And and I grew up and you know or, or went through an age of thinking, man, we'll never see another Tom Brady just because of of, of what he was able to do. But then you got a guy like Mahomes that's that's that seems to be one up in him. You know. Uh, yeah, for, for, for w- sure. Will he get? Will he get to six or seven? Though I mean, you can't I can't rule I, it out based I, on I, how I, this is going. Yeah, especially too when you look at what he did with the weapons around him. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, and now look, I, I think Pacheco is 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 an amazing uh, running back for for what they ask him to do. But you know, outside of Tra- Travis Kelsey, uh, Miko Hardman had three catches for fifty seven yards. He did have a uh, uh, you know obviously. A, a huge catch in that game. Uh, Watson, uh, three, for, you know, the other tight end, three for 54 yards. Uh, Rashid uh, Rice, six for only 39. Pacheco had six for 33. Another backup tight end, two for 22. And Gray, uh, Valdez scandling, three catches, 20 yards. You know, they, they made the most out of, out of, out of what they had. And if, and if a quarterback, long story short, a, the quarterback can elevate everybody around him. And that was a, a another great example mm-hmm. of that in a big game. And it goes back to shame on me. Don't bet against Mahomes in a big <laughs> game, period. Uh, uh, this is, is and has been a quarterback driven league. And that came to fruition in the biggest game of the 2023 season, Sunday night. 
And that that's the takeaway, I think, is it, you you got to have a quarterback to <laughs> win Super Bowls in this league. And we already do that, but here reinforced. Right. I do want to give the Chiefs defense credit, though, because that unit is super strong and that helped carry them as their offense, as you said, sputtered throughout the season. Chris Jones up front, right. just consistent pass rush. Their secondary play was great. McDuffie making plays. Mike Edwards making some plays. The, the fantastic play calls by Steve Spagnola sending more pressure. They really impacted the 49ers. I mean, if Chris Jones doesn't get some of that pressure that he got in the second half, they don't win that game, even with Mahomes heroics and in great play. So I think defensively getting the pressure on Purdy, the Niners not running the football, some run blitzes from Kansas City to, I think, dissuade San Francisco from running the football. That also was a huge component of this game. Boy, Spagnolia has got quite, quite, quite the resume now as well, too, doesn't he? Yeah. How many rings does that guy have now? He's got four or five. How many rings does Steve Spagnola have I'd at this have point? i to look, but... Uh... You know, he, he's somebody when, you know, that I, I made sure to go out of my way to to talk about as far as a preview in the game, because that, that guy is not afraid to dial up pressures in, you know, in certain situations where other defensive coordinators w- wouldn't be willing to. Yeah. Four rings for Spagnola. King um, of the, the zero, Chiefs. king of the zero blitz, and, you know, just. Uh, uh, corner blitzes and all like that. So anyway, I know people tuning in don't want to hear, hear about Chiefs Depot and all like that. But uh, uh, yeah, Patrick, you know, I, I think you boil this down to uh, uh, defense by the Chiefs in, in key waiting moments, as you mentioned, and then obviously the waiting moments on the offensive side of football for the Chiefs. And then Patrick Mahomes happens. Quick Steeler tie-ins from the Super Bowl because we love to do our little Steelers tie-ins for these things. The 49ers will not tie the Steelers for most Super Bowl victories by a franchise with six. San Francisco remains at five, so it's the Steelers and Patriots that each have six. Jawan Jennings became the first and second wide receiver in Super Bowl history to throw a touchdown pass since Antoine Randall in Super Bowl 40 against the Seahawks. Uh, let's see, two former Steelers from the Chiefs side are Super Bowl champions. That's defensive lineman Isaiah Bugs and quarterback Chris Oladokun. Oladokun has two rings in two years. Bugs his first. Both were on the practice squad. Neither played, of course, in this game. So just a quick note there about those two uh, world champs. And for Oladokun, world champs again. Mm. <laughs> good for uh, him. Yeah, good, good for both those guys there. So, all right. Well, I guess we're officially in the offseason now. It is. We're all zero and zero again. So that's clean slate across the board. All right, Dave, let's dive into the Steelers aspect here. Some news over the weekend, actually on Sunday morning, Ian Rappaport, NFL Network coming out. Two reports that still seem a little vague to me, but they are certainly notable for us to discuss, indicating that Mason Rudolph may be looking for a fresh start, speaking of clean slates here and zero and zero. It may seem like Rudolph has indicated to the team he will at least be exploring options elsewhere and may not be as uh, inclined to resign with Pittsburgh as they want him to to be, and as inclined Pittsburgh seems to be to want to resign Mason Rudolph. So no definitive word there, but it is looking like there's a, there's a pretty decent chance Rudolph will go elsewhere. And that, of course, leads to the question, okay, if not Rudolph, which veteran quarterback will Pittsburgh have in camp to compete with Kenny Pickett? And this was more of a obvious statement of very, very broad, but Rappaport indicating Pittsburgh will explore and entertain the idea of signing Ryan Tannehill, who, of course, um, his career was revived by Arthur Smith in Tennessee in 2019 and 2020. Smith now the OC in Pittsburgh. So that's a logical connection we made basically right after the hire was announced. Uh, yeah, the way the way those insiders framed it was quite interesting. And especially the words that they use. I'm going to pull them both up here. Uh, specifically when he talked about uh, let's see with Tanny Hill, he, he's, he writes with new offensive coordinator, Arthur Smith. The expectation is Pittsburgh will explore adding free agent, Ryan Tanny Hill, who had his best years with the Titans while Smith was the OC there. Uh, no, no, no hidden, you know, message with that. You know, all that is, it feels like is kind of connecting the dots mm-hmm. more than anything. We've obviously written, talked a little bit about Tanny Hill there. I think the more interesting thing was the war- wording used with the Mason Rudolph uh, blurb in there where uh, Rudolph 
who will be a free agent next month, has indicated he's interested in a fresh start after six seasons with the team uh, that drafted him in the third round of, uh, in, in 2018. Uh, has indicated he's interested in a fresh start to who? Yeah, the, the wording gets a little vague and up for interpretation. It seems my my takeaway was that a fresh start somewhere else, because when they say after six seasons with the team that drafted him, a fresh start would mean going somewhere else now. But he you know, has we- has indicated he's interested. That makes it where because everything that's come out of Mason Rudolph's mouth so far is just, you know, I, I got to look around, you know, mm-hmm. Uh, nothing to the, at least from what I've seen, nothing to the effect of, yeah, I'm really interested in getting a fresh start somewhere else, you know? Right. Now, now is this, is this one of the, uh, huh? He's been non-committal. He's not really made an indication either way, whether or not he wanted to come back or. All right. You know. But, but the, but the way this blurb sounds, mm-hmm. uh, from, 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 from the NFL.com guys is that one of them has heard from somebody that he's interested in a fresh start. Yeah. There's some right? stuff being said behind the scenes. Sure. Okay. All right. So I'd, I'd be interested to, you know, to hear the source of that. Right. I have no idea what the source is. I mean, I just based off of that. And then as Rappaport says, they're going to look at Tannehill would also indicate that that would, because if, if Rudolph were to resign, they're not going to look at Tannehill. Right. right. There's no, there's no need to. So the, the fresh start I assume is that Rudolph will be looking to go elsewhere which means Pittsburgh has to look at other options, which would lead them to Tannehill. Right, right. It's not going to be, a, and, I, and I wrote this in my initial post yesterday morning, it's not going to be a uh, a both situation. Uh, it might it might end up being a neither, but mm-hmm. uh, it, it most certainly won't be uh, both Mason Rudolph and Ryan Tannehill in that quarterback room along with, 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 with Kenny Pickett. Right. Now the question is, what is Rudolph's market value? How much... Uh, action does he have how many teams are interested what the what's the money you know, available i think pittsburgh values him probably more than what the rest of the league still will just based off of what he's done and they really do i think sincerely want rudolph back he's kind of the perfect guy in their mind to compete with kenny pickett so you know we listen this time a year ago i thought rudolph was gone for good like no chance he was going to come back and he had an icy cold market and then just kind of you know slumped his way back to pittsburgh before the draft and I think he'll certainly have a more robust and active market this time around, but how good will it be considering those other, it's a, it's a much better quarterback class in the draft. It's much better quarterback for agency class and potential trade options in Justin Fields. Now, Matt Jones likely to be dealt based off of reporting on Sunday, Kirk Cousins, Russell Wilson, et cetera. Um, you know, that may hurt Rudolph's market value because there are so many other options out there for teams. Here's the thing. Uh, not, not that a lot of people like us reference in PFF, but uh, I think they have Ryan Tannehill is ranked 68 overall in their top uh, 150 players set to enter free agency. I do not believe they have Mason Rudolph uh, in that 150. And then when you look over at uh, uh, their free agent rankings that also include uh, quarterback you know, expected, expected contracts along with it. Once again, they don't have, uh, they don't have Mason Rudolph listed and they have, you know, obviously they have Ryan Tannehill, uh, ranked 68 behind only Kirk cousins, uh, when it comes to free agent quarterbacks and they even have Baker Mayfield behind, Mm. uh, 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 Ryan Tannehill, uh, there. Now, when it comes to, projected contract, which I think overall they do a fairly good job uh, on, on, on those in that aspect ahead of free agency. They have uh, Ryan Tannehill down for two years at 5.5 million average, 10 million guaranteed, $11 million total. So in other words, a two year, $11 million contract with 10 million of it guaranteed for an average yearly value of 5.5 million. That, that feels very, very real. It does. Although for somebody ranked so high on that quarterback list, it's a lower number than what I expected. What do they have for Baker? Cause Baker's going to get paid. I assume he'll stay in Tampa Bay. 
They okay. have three years uh, at twenty-five million dollar average. Uh, so three years, seventy-five million dollars total. Uh, okay. 40, 40 million guaranteed. Uh, uh, but he's uh, behind Tannehill. He's, right, he is number seventy-five overall on their on their listings, whereas Ryan Tannehill is sixty-eighth overall. Uh, and then by, even behind him, and they they've got some guys getting paid uh more than 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 Tannehill. And obviously, a lot of this revolves around. Tanny Hill's age and sure uh, and, and 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 all like that, but they have even Gardner Minshew, uh, two years at eight point seven five million, seventeen point five million total on that with nine million guaranteed. Uh, they have Jacoby Brissett at one year six and a half uh, million. Might you get your wish and that be the way that, or uh, not not necessarily your wish, but a mm-hmm. uh, guy that you talked about. I think over the last couple of off seasons here, uh, in, in, in Jacoby Brissett, uh, how old is Jacoby Brissett now? He's 31, 31 now, I think. Okay. That sounds about right. Yeah. He's still, uh, still pretty young for the position. I, I guess my, my takeaway when, when, you know, where does Mason a, where does Mason Rudolph slot in all, all this? I mean, if you're talking about a guy like Gardner Minshew two years at 17 and a half million, and he's obviously played, a lot more than a guy like Mason Rudolph, right? Right. Uh, does that feel does Does that kind of feel like the like a ceiling for Mason Rudolph? It does. I mean, I think he'll be in that three to five million. Let's call it four million per year range is where Rudolph ultimately slots in at. All right. What do you think about the Ryan Tanny? It's pretty much same per year, right? Five and a half million because they've got him mm-hmm. down two years, eleven million. In other words, uh, it it feels like both those guys, Tanny Hill and and Mason, will be under ten million, easily under ten million per year for 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 both those guys. Sure. The question with, is with Tanny Hill, probably I I would I would dare say Tanny Hill having a less yearly average than than Mason. I would I would think because of the whole age thing. Yeah, I mean, there's a bit more of a, a body of work with Tannehill that right. I think will give some teams comfort. Who would you rather have, Tannehill or Rudolph? Uh, I'd rather have, I think, just based off that, uh, you know, him him being in Pittsburgh and knowing the personnel and and being younger uh, overall. I uh, and because of the you know at his his arm talent at his age, I think I'd rather have Rudolph. Yeah, it's kind of where I lean too. I didn't really watch Tannehill up and you know, up close and personal. My concern is just where they're going, you know, Tannehill on the backswing of his career, a bunch of injuries, a lot of lower leg injuries, ankle type stuff. He's had problems with the last two seasons and, you know, Rudolph kind of playing the best football of his NFL career. He obviously getting the opportunity when he hadn't had it in past years. Um, so that, that's one element of it, but I mean, I just kind of see where they're not just where they're at now, but where they're going to be a year or two from now kind of makes me lean Rudolph, but Tannehill, the the connection with Arthur Smith, a a bit better fit for the system from a mobility standpoint, getting out of the pocket, moving to the launch point standpoint, there's a, there's a a more of a fit there potentially, but, um, you know, I, I've expressed, I'd I'd be happy for Rudolph to come back. I'd like for him to come back. I'm not sure if he's going to come back now, but that's kind of where I start and go from there. Uh, you know, guaranteed money is obviously something that's going to be talked about because even even with a guy like Mitch Trubisky, when they signed Mitch Trubisky a couple of years ago, uh, all that guaranteed money was in basically in year one, right? You know, with a signing right. bonus and, and 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 the base salary for the Steelers to go out with either go out to either Ryan Tannehill or Mason Rudolph and provide anything more in the form of guaranteed money outside of a signing bonus and the first year base salary, that would be quite unusual. Now they could, they could put incentives in there for both those guys, playtime incentives and, 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 uh, playoff incentives in there, much like they did, uh, with Rudolph to give the quarterback the ability to potentially earn more money. Uh, I could see them doing that. But, you know, when you look at specifically what PFF has down here for Ryan Tannehill talking about 10 million uh, uh, guaranteed, I mean, that they they would they would 
and it's only $11 million contract, I mean, you're, you're essentially guaranteeing past that first year of the deal. And I would be a bit surprised to see the Steelers do that. Yeah, they're not going to do that. Because I mean, Trubisky had incentives, right? That was in his contract. Right, right. They were not likely to be earned, but they were incentives. Right. And those and, and those were just determined based off of what you did the previous year in terms of likely or not likely to, to be earned incentives, correct? That's just right. how that aspect works. Right. Likely to be earned mean uh, means that you hit those the same criteria the previous season, whereas not likely to be earned uh, means you did not hit that same set of criteria in the preseason in the previous season there. And not likely to be earned does not count against the cap, mm. uh, whereas likely to be earned does. Maybe harder for the incentives because Trubisky didn't really play the year before. He was the backup in Buffalo through like six passes. And, you know, he was, you could have had he throw for 300 yards and that would have been a not likely to be earned incentive because he didn't do it the year before. But I don't need to be a little bit different for Tannehill who, who played some last year. Although I think Trubisky's was like a Pro Bowl incentive and I forget what the others were. Play, but the others were play time, time and all. And the okay. thing you, thing you got to remember as well, too, is when he signed that, that was pre them drafting. Uh, uh, Kenny Pickett. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he had, had, had it come after that, he probably would have changed the threshold <laughs> thresholds of those playtime uh, sure. in, 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 in incentives there. But uh, I mean, who else other than you know? We both agree that 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 Mitch is going to be out the door and have for a while, right? Yeah. The only question is if Rudolph seems to be out the door as well. Do you hang on to Trubisky for a little bit until you have some other option in place? I don't know right. if that's the calculation you want to make, but it's a consideration. Well, historically, this team does not like to have any given uh, point where they don't have at least two two players under contract. You yeah, know, but so they kind of did it in Pittsburgh before drafting Pickett, right? They had they were really light there because Ben retired, and well, didn't you have the whole uh, Haskins thing though? Yeah, I'm trying to think of how many quarterbacks are on the roster. I guess, I mean, he passed away, I think, in April uh, before the draft. Yeah, it would have been after Trubisky had signed. So I'd have to go back and check. But I, I, I think, I, I don't think they want to get themselves in a situation at any given time on the NFL calendar where they don't have two under contract. And obviously, Pickett's one of them, you know. Sure, sure. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you might be right. You know, if, if they... Uh, well, here, here's the thing with uh, with the way free agency and the dates are with those roster bonuses, they probably would like to have that uh, second quarter. You know, they'd like to probably know one of Ryan Tannehill or Mason Rudolph or, mm-hmm. uh, you know, go down the list here, you know, Brissett. Uh, some, they'd probably like to know the outcome of one of those guys by the time the uh, by the time the Mitch Trubisky roster bonuses do. And they have three or four days right. in, in the legal tampering period and the actual start of free agency and plus all the scuttlebutt at the combine. They they should have an idea of what, sure. what they're going to get before that bonus decision comes due. All right. Uh, will it be one of Ryan Tannehill, Mesa Rudolph, Jacoby Brissett? Well, I think certainly Rudolph and Tannehill are the front runners and maybe Tannehill even overtaking Rudolph based on this reporting. Although we'll see again, I think Rudolph, Never really quite sure what that market's going to be. And, you know, I think Pittsburgh sincerely wants him back. But it's logical to say Tannehill. I mean, he worked well with Arthur Smith and he's a system fit. So it would make a lot of sense. It does feel like it might be one of those three, though. And and has for a little bit now. So so none of that was earth shattering when it came out. But uh, the, the, the thing that that caught my eye the most was the was the wording used on Mason Rudolph. Sure, that's more notable. Absolutely. And it's still a little, little unclear what that means. And Rudolph could think that and then he gets out and checks his market and says, I'm getting, you know, two million dollars from these other teams and Pittsburgh's offering me four. And you know what? Let's go back to Pittsburgh. I mean that that may be the calculation. We'll just have to wait and see. Right. All right, let's see what else came out here. Um, one uh, piece of news that I think we had missed last week, and we had talked about when Art Rooney had spoken with Bob Pompiani in a 1v1 interview about him not ruling out, not closing the door on a quarterback trade. The next day, he had an interview, and by that point, the headlines were all about those comments that Rooney made, and we had discussed them. 
And then Rooney the next day sat down with uh, Andrew Stocky, local reporter in Pittsburgh, and clarified those comments, saying that it was unlikely they were going to make a big blockbuster trade for a quarterback. He just didn't want to close the door. It was kind of more just, you know, we're going to have an open mind this time of year. But essentially saying, don't get carried away, carried away with my comment about trading for a quarterback or keeping that door open because it probably will not happen. And I think that was our initial even takeaway with the Bob Pompiani uh, interview was it felt it felt oh it felt generic overall. Yeah, it was worth noting because he didn't close the door. And right. so you should make note of that. But it didn't mean and we said this, it didn't mean, oh, my God, they're going to go get Justin Fields tomorrow. That was not how I interpreted his right. comment. Right. Me, me either. And it would be quite surprised, you know, uh, regardless of what Rooney uh, would and would or did or didn't say uh, over the course of this last several weeks. You know, all, all the talk about, you know, Kirk Cousins and Russell Wilson and uh, Fields and I mean, throw, I guess now Mac Jones is supposedly might be on the market. Uh, it doesn't feel like. Doesn't feel like there's going to be any anything that's going to require if they do go outside and and, and do and, and acquire a quarterback via a trade of some sort. There's not going to be a lot of a lot of draft capital involved in it. No, it's not going to be a Justin Fields. Mac Jones is kind of interesting from the standpoint of what's his value. It's got to be pretty low right now. Getting benched in New England, having a miserable season. He says, obviously, any team who rosters him will decline his upcoming fifth year option. So it makes him a free agent after 2024. I was a big Matt Jones fan coming out of Alabama, and he had a really strong rookie season, and it's all kind of gone downhill since. And how much of that blame is on him, on coaching, on lack of talent around him? You can debate all those kinds of things. I'm not saying they're going to go trade for Matt Jones. I do right. think that's an interesting name to think about, just big picture NFL wise in this pre draft offseason process. All right. Uh, I mean, what, what's what's the biggest question facing you know, and has been, you know, coming out of the 2023 season for the Steelers and and even up to to this point is it's it's the quarterback position. What can they get out of the quarterback position in 2024? Seems like, and who will that be? Uh, seems like the biggest overall overarching question, right? Right. And it will remain that way until they answer it. Right. It's the biggest question. And until they have a clear answer and a good answer, then it's going to be awfully hard to compete and get as far as they want to, to go and, and to become. And uh, no, you know, whether whether or not you know how much stock you want to put in the early Super Bowl odds uh, that come rushing out right after the big game uh, last night. There's not a lot of uh, betting confidence in the Steelers at this point, when it comes to the 2024 season, uh, DraftKings, uh, at least right out of the shoot, seems to be really them and Westgate Superbook in 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 Las Vegas here seem to kind of be the two, you know, you, uh, outliers, I guess you'd call it. E- even even though you're not talking about a huge, I guess once you get past. 50 to one, 60 to one, uh, it all becomes those other teams, you know, mm-hmm. uh, but DraftKings, I think, uh, open up with the Steelers at 75 to one to win, uh, the, the Super Bowl next season, uh, Westgate and Las Vegas Superbook, 80 to one and both FanDuel and bet MGM, uh, at least opened up with the Steelers at 100 to one. And as you can imagine, probably on all four of those lists, uh, the Steelers were probably in the, in the bottom quarter, right? But bo- bo- bottom eight mm-hmm. or so teams in each, each one of those when it came to odds. So there's not a lot. Uh, the takeaway here is the Steelers are not expected to win the Super Bowl. In, 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 in 2024, as we sit here today. Now, this is obviously right out of the shoot here, and you have the draft and free agency and all that stuff that can happen, and obviously injuries can shape things, but uh, the main reason for this has got to be the quarterback position, the uncertainty. 100%. And I hope you were sitting down for that news that Pittsburgh mm. is not pre- predicted to have high odds to win the Super Bowl. They have the lowest odds of any playoff team last year. 
So in, in like by a, a considerable margin, I think in DraftKings, the next closest playoff team with the worst odds are like the Browns at 35 to one and Pittsburgh's at 75 to one. So big, big drop off there. But yeah, it is the quarterback position. It is the uncertainty there because you watch Patrick Mahomes win again. It's because they have the, they have the best quarterback in football and that's kind of what's able to drag them over the finish line. So unless you have just a, a mountain of talent you know, on your roster as the Niners did with, with good quarterback play and Purdy. Like, those are the two ways you win it, which is absurdly good roster and great scheme and really good coaching and good injury luck and, and competent quarterback play or elite quarterback play that just gets you there with, you know, hopefully a good defense. Those are your paths. And Pittsburgh is not really in either camp right now. Right. That will be the huge question and has been. You know, since Ben Roethlisberger moved on, how, you know, who's, who's going to be the next franchise quarterback and will that quarterback, whenever they find out who that is, uh, be able to be one that allows them to compete year in and year out. And if you know, you can make the playoffs and as we saw this year, uh, with, with the Steelers, but if you're going to make noise and get deep into playoffs and make a run for the Super Bowl, I mean, you, and, and, and ultimately win it, you've got to have a quarterback. Uh, I think you even had a terrible, was it the terrible take the other day is what will the Steelers, what was it? Win win a Super Bowl in the next 15 years. What, what, mm-hmm. what, what brought that on? I think it was about the 15 year anniversary of their last Super Bowl. I think it was okay. or something about that. But yeah, the question is, you know, had you told somebody after the, the, the Super Bowl win over the Cardinals, this team will not win a Super Bowl for the next 15 years. I think most people would have said, ah, you're, you're, I think they'll win another. They got talent. They got Ben and, you know. That's even before you even knew AB existed and, and that kind of stuff. In the next 15 years, I know it's an impossible question to, to answer, but will they win a Super Bowl 15 years from now, Dave? Yeah, it's impossible to answer, but I'll <laughs> tell you what. I, I'll tell you what. Uh, when I was a kid and the Steelers came, you know, growing up where I did and 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 in the 70s and uh seeing this team win, you know, the amount of Super Bowls that they that they won never you know, young me would have never imagined been waiting so long <laughs> to see <laughs> uh, the Steelers, you know, win, win their next one. And uh, uh, obviously, you know, want, want a couple to get to, 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 together there in those, uh, what, 2005 and uh, 2008, oh, eight, eight, yep. eight, eight seasons. And then, you know, made it back there again in, 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 in 2010. And, but uh it, it does make you sit back and wonder, especially knowing a lot more about the game than I did now. And, you know, knowing them following this team year in and year out. And, you know, it does make you kind of wonder how, how long that gap will be before they do win their next Super Bowl. Pittsburgh, historically, their Super Bowl wins come in bunches. The dynasty in the 70s and the early to early mid to late 2000s and a lot of lulls in between. So they went from, 79 they won their fourth they didn't win their fifth until 2005 and in this afc landscape where you have these great quarterbacks who are largely young Mahomes is 28 burrow is i don't know a little bit younger than that lamar around you know 27 whatever old he is those guys are going to be around for a while for the next 10 years so who knows if pittsburgh finds a franchise quarterback their next guy they'll be right back in it and in the mix but i'll put the odds as uh pretty low they win a ring in the next 15 years you know, uh, like I said, circling back to when I was a kid, you just thought all they had to do is put on that black and gold uniform, and you know, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you know that 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 guarantees that they're going to be in 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 the running for the Super Bowl. But it it it's 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 no longer that. I mean, it, it's not that. You know, you got to have uh, you got to have players, and, and most specifically in this day and age, you got to have uh, got to have a quarterback, and it it does lead one to question. Uh, what's going to happen over the course of the next the next 15 years. Not that the odds matter much, if at all, but it is interesting because we both reasonably could expect Pittsburgh to make the playoffs next year, correct? I think, it, I mean, to, to shoot, for what they were able to do this year and still make it and, and, and go through what they did and lose to the two and whatever, two and ten teams, and, and but still be able to find a way, uh, especially with the injuries that they had. And, and look, every team has injuries, but uh, uh, long story short, it, it, it wouldn't be shocking if this team made the playoffs. It's the expectation. They should, I think. I mean, we'll see how the roster looks come 
come camp, but you know, based on where they're at and where they can be, they should make the playoffs. And yet they still have some of the longest odds to win the Super Bowl. They're right. with teams who are not expected to make the playoffs. They're with teams who are picking in the top five. So that's essentially saying you got hundred to one odds they're gonna win the Super Bowl. Let's say they make the playoffs 80% of the time, but those hundred to one odds is basically saying like, you know, 80, 80 to one odds they'll make the playoffs and won't win the Super Bowl, even though they're in the final 14, which is, which is essentially saying is they're good enough to get there, but they're not expected to do anything once they get there because of the quarterback disadvantage. Well, shoot, at this at this point in time, we just like to see them win a playoff game, you know, right. and, yeah. and Rooney, Rooney in so many words uh, or not so many words. He did say it's 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 time, you know. It is time. It's frustrating. The angst and it builds each year. No win since 2016 to lose and to lose in a repeated fashion of getting blown out or falling behind, having to climb back in to get upset at home in some cases against the Jaguars, against the Browns. Yeah, I mean, this. there is not a lot of confidence in this team because they're not giving you much to be confident about because they can't get over this hump. They're, they're competitive. They're in the hunt. They're always, they always find a way to squeak in more often than not. But once they get there, what do they do? Yeah, here, here's the thing, though. Has winning a playoff game become the Steelers' Super Bowl? <laughs> well, that's that, that's the issue, but I think James Harrison talks about the standard lowering, and right. you go back to just have a winning season and let's just make the playoffs, and that's not the standard Pittsburgh, you know, what they aspire to be. And obviously winning Super Bowls are hard and until you find a quarterback, you know, good luck. But, yeah, I mean, I think, I think Harrison has truth in that comment. Mm. All right, Dave, uh, kind of wrapping things up here. I want to talk a little bit more about Tom R., the Steelers' new quarterback coach, and that was officially announced on Friday. I believe the days are running together, but last uh, couple of days that was announced. And when the hire was made, you know, we talked about him some on the last show. I didn't know much about him. I knew his top-line background. Um, you know, obviously the, the Chargers pass game coordinator, or pass game specialist, whatever the term was, the last two seasons, but I wanted to do a, a deeper dive into Tom R. Unfortunately. I couldn't find, you know, clinic tape or a ton of real coaching, philosophical, schematic background information on Tom Arth. But I found a lot of just kind of about his upbringing um, and kind of where he he comes from. I think the most interesting part from what I learned that I didn't know before, you know, when he when the Arth hire got made, a lot of the headlines or the articles will say he was Peyton Manning's backup, and that's true in a sense. But also, I think it misses the boat in a lot of different ways. Um, a, he was the backup, but he was a practice squatter. He was never Jim Sorchi. He was never the number two behind Peyton Manning. He played with the Colts that North did, uh, from 2003 to 2005, but never made the roster. It was always a practice squad kind of guy. But what I think is more interesting is that he was not just Peyton Manning's backup. Those two have become incredibly close. I shouldn't say incredibly, but they've become friends. Like they've known each other and they've kept in touch. And Manning seems to have a lot of respect for Tom Arth to even to the point where when Arth was in the running to get the job at Akron to become their head coach in 2019. Peyton Manning personally called the Akron AD, Larry Williams, and gave him a really strong endorsement about Tom Marth, about a really smart guy, you know, been played at every level. Um, I think it's going to serve him well. And Arth got the Akron job. Now, it did not go well. Arth had a terrible time in Akron because it's Akron and they don't win. Um, but they actually have stayed in touch and Arth has worked at Manning's uh, passing camps before as a counselor, and those guys have actually, um, I think, been pretty close. So uh, Peyton Manning backup does not really describe the relationship between Tom Arth and Peyton Manning. It's actually a pretty close friendship. Well, out, you know, obviously you have to go, and and you will, I, I would imagine, moving forward here, go deeper into kind of some of the tape and 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 philo- you know philosophical as best as you can. It sucks that there. I, I look to there's. You yeah, know, just not much out there. Because I mean, not, he, when you're a head coach, you're not spilling secrets about your philosophy, right? And there's, you know, there's, you know, coaching, no cl- coaching clinics to go look at. And I know we're both big fans of those. You've done some great ones over the years with, with wide receiver coaches, and and I mean, p- any type of offensive coach. You know, you, you generally you're able to pull up uh, some sort. Of, you know, it was a good find a couple of weeks ago. Was uh, us talking about Arthur Smith and being able mm-hmm. to go through that and all like that. I guess my biggest question for you at this point in your study on Arth would be from what you do know, what do you think is the biggest, maybe two or three things that he brings to the Steelers specifically when it comes to the quarterback position? Well, I think he does have a lot of 
experience. I mean, he became, he was a head coach at three schools by the age of 37, which you don't see too often. Now they weren't, you know, Alabama. It was John Carroll where he played actually is referred to the greatest player in John Carroll history, which I did not know. Um, And then UT Chattanooga and then Akron. But there is that level of experience about being a head coach and managing and delegating that I think is impressive for his age. He does seem very personable and he kind of follows that, you know, there's been a thought this hiring cycle for NFL coaches was they strayed away from the Belichick's and the Rabels because they wanted guys who were kind of more, more positive, more of a, you know, am I describing this well? Like, you know, the Raheem Morris's of the world that seemed to kind of always just have that really upbeat attitude. And I think coaches were kind of ownership was embracing those type of coaches more. And Arth kind of seems to be that, that type of dude that like is always, you know, just coming in with a really, really positive attitude overall, as opposed to a bit more of the curmudgeonly, I guess, Bill Belichick. What right or wrong, who knows? You can debate debate that, but that's kind of the prevailing wisdom. So I think Arth kind of has that. Um, and I mean, you know, he, he, he's a hard worker and I think the quarterbacks that were never the most talented are the guys that can become the, uh, among the best coaches because they really had to work extra hard at the game. And he was somebody that was always identified as a really bright guy and, and with the Manning connections and Tony Dungy offered him a coaching position when he was with the Colts, he turned it down because he wanted to keep playing football. I, I bet you Mike Tomlin called Tony Dungy and just said, give me some information on Tom Arth, uh, Tom Arth. That's because, a good point. Um, there was a pretty good relationship there with the Colts. You know, one, one of the, uh, and once again, you know, beyond getting into more schematics and, 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 and looking at tape and even so you don't know how much of an influence in, in some of these NFL stops he's had, uh, which, which you would think he would have some input into game plans and, and yada, yada. But, you know, the link to, to Manning is, is, is it really sticks out at least in, in your initial deep dive here, because one thing Peyton, and, and I say that because, you know, uh, obviously everybody knows how, how good Peyton Manning was in the league, but Peyton Manning, even go, going back to those uh, post-career uh, videos, fantastically done that Manning did on the ESPN uh, insiders and all like that. Peyton Manning is a big uh, technique and 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 uh, little things from snap to into play like properly carrying out ball fakes and properly carrying out proper footwork and 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 the the very little intricacies and and points uh handoff points on stretch you know how far you want to get on on certain stretch plays ideally and splits and and those kind of things details 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 uh the little things that that aren't uh, that that aren't talked about um, uh, a lot, and then kind of tying that back into things that Arthur Smith said in that in that in that coaching tape about making sure these quarterbacks properly uh, carry out these fakes where everything kind of looks the same. Mm-hmm. Uh, at least initially, that's that's one of the huge pluses that I that I, that I take away from this is is I would hope that. Arth will will expect his the, the quarterbacks to be as detail orientated as a guy like Peyton Manning was during his prime. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so. And when you're a head coach, I think you demand those types of things, you know, and understand the importance of the details. And when you're a quarterback like Tom Arth, who was probably at least once he got to the, uh, the NFL level, not the most talented quarterback in that room, had to be detailed, had to be on his P's and Q's to give every advantage for him to to be able to make plays and, and try to stick. My last note on Tom Morris in terms of, I, I don't know if anyone is wondering, but if anyone is, how does the head coach from Akron who gets fired become an NFL coach in, in a season? And their answer to that is, um, so Arth got fired by Akron in, in 2021, midseason got hired by the Chargers in 2022. And that was because of the relationships he had with Brandon Staley, the Chargers then head coach, and the then GM Tom Telesco. When Arth was the head coach at John Carroll back in the mid 2010s, he hired Brandon Staley to be his defensive coordinator. And that was a connection they had, obviously, once Arth got fired. And Tom Telesco scouted Tom Arth when he came out of college and signed with the Colts, where Telesco was a scout. And Tom Telesco is from John Carroll, which is where Arth is from. Mm -hmm. So the connections of John Carroll and Arth hiring Staley, those guys kind of returned the favor and gave Arth a job in 2022. 
you know, in, in reading back through this uh, as well, too, and you obviously mentioned, you know, Tony Dungeon, all you mentioned Jim Caldwell's name in here as well, too. And obviously right. there's been a connection. Uh, there's been a few times, you know, in, in, in offensive coordinator searches in the past where you kind of wondered if uh, Jim Caldwell might be a guy that 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 Mike Tomlin uh, settled on there. Uh, those two have qu- quite the connection, Tomlin and Caldwell, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And I think even Howard Mudd or um, not Howard Mudd, uh, Tom Moore was with the Colts as well uh, when Arth was there and former Steelers coach Tom, Tom Moore was. So a lot of connections there. I also found out that John Carroll has a million NFL connections. It's ridiculous how many mm. NFL coaches and GMs have come from John Carroll or the surrounding area, whether that's Telesco, uh, Staley, Jonathan Gannon and Dave Ragone went to high school nearby John Carroll, Dave Ziegler, Josh McDaniels, uh, Nick Casario. I mean, there's like nine people that come from the John Carroll or that, wow. that Cle- Cleveland region. So uh, pretty crazy uh, hotbed for the NFL. All right. Well, good initial deep dive. Helped me learn uh, uh, a lot more than ab- about Tom Arth than I knew initially. We talked about Manning endorsing Arth. One other endorsement I think will make Steeler fans feel a bit better is Dick LeBeau uh, endorsing the hire of Arthur Smith. Uh, Scott Brown, great job to interview Dick LeBeau over this weekend, who worked with Arthur Smith for three years in Tennessee, where LeBeau was the defensive coordinator and Arthur was the um, excuse me, not Arthur, uh, Arthur Smith. I'm going to get those guys mixed up. Uh, was the was the tight ends coach there, and LeBeau uh, gave Smith his full endorsement. Believes that's a perfect fit. So for anybody on the fence. Dick LeBeau, two thumbs up on this hire. All right. And, and excellent job. Scott Brown's obviously uh, uh, writing a book uh, and, and talks to Dick LeBeau uh, quite frequently, I think. Yeah. And he's able to get pick his brain about Arthur Smith. All right, Dave, anything else or anything else that we're missing? We can kind of wrap things up a little bit shorter show today and get to some reader emails, which we did not get to on Friday. We can kind of make up for that today. All right, that sounds like a plan. Let me sort these out here real quick here. And no live stream tonight, right? Yeah, no live stream tonight. We'll uh, be back next week. I think it'll be just me because Dave will be uh, on the road, I think, hanging out with uh, Ross McCorkle and and Joe Clark. So uh, just me. You're stuck with me just uh, next week on. on Uh, That's probably not a bad thing overall. (laughs) Uh, Let's see here. Let's go to Travis Pick writes in. Happy Super Bowl, gang. With about 4.45 left in the second quarter, the camera showed an extremely zoomed-in view of Coach Spags and his play sheet. He says, can the opposing team see that, and could they use that to gain an advantage? Part two of my question, he says, just happened. Have you guys ever seen a lateral pass screen play like the McCaffrey TD before? Okay. Uh, I mean, we, I mean, uh, the funny thing about the, uh, the, the, the McCaffrey, the Jennings, the McCaffrey TD is, uh, Jen, they ran a similar play, uh, back in Tennessee, uh, on, 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 on a throwback from, uh, Juwan Jennings to all people, Joshua Dobbs, uh, there. So, uh, I, I, the uniqueness of that play, you know, as a whole, uh, Probably not that. I it did feel like it took forever to develop. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and and where you're calling it and the situation it took. You know, ha- those plays are always judged by results. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> and, and always will be. But uh, uh, I it was it was fun to watch. I I, I will tell you that. Uh, but I I don't think the the, the uniqueness of it overall was all that just that it's being called in a big game, right? Yeah. I'm sure we've seen similar throwbacks before. And as you said, it's actually funny. They ran the same play at Tennessee and that probably was where the inspiration for that play came from. Jennings was a high school quarterback converted wide receiver and threw a couple of touchdowns with the volunteers. Um, so yeah, I mean, nothing that was that radical, but it, it just happened to work. All right, about the uh, 445 left in the second quarter showed an extremely zoomed-in view of Coach Spags and his play sheet. Can ex- can opposing teams see that, uh, and and could they use to, use it to gain their gain an advantage? Well, the thing is, yeah, I, I would imagine that if you had wanted somebody to sit there and study the TV uh, game in real time, there have an assistant on that, and then could you know how quickly could you turn that 
that info around and use it to your advantage. And, you know, it's not like they don't study tape anyway when it comes to personnel groupings and tendencies and all like that. So, you know, my main takeaway is, I mean, I yeah, they could probably see it, but how how quickly I, I, I don't I don't see it being as a, a, a gain as an advantage in real time there and getting a close up of a play sheet. I don't think it's anything real time, but I think after the fact, you know, if you ever saw them again, especially if it's a divisional opponent or just somebody that you saw in the regular season and you're playing in the playoffs. Yeah, I think you use everything if you have that opportunity. I mean, that is if I'm a coach, I would be like, please do not show close ups of my coach holding my play sheet because mm. I've done that. I took a there was that screenshot of Sean Payton and I went through his whole play sheet and broke down every aspect I could break down. So if I'm right. doing it, I promise you NFL teams are doing it. Is it helping them real time? No. But if it's information they're probably absorbing and taking in, uh, they better because every advantage in the NFL, I mean, with how protective teams are, you get the information like that legally. Dude, you take advantage of that all day long. And if you're a defensive core any coordinator and you see that happen, your 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 uh, reverse scouting should be how much was my play sheet shown on TV and how much do I need to change? You know, yeah. uh, I, I need to do some self scouting there. So good question. Uh L Luke writes in, do you think Keanu Benton's future and most upside for the defense is as is as a base? Uh, nose tackle with two defensive ends next to him or more disruptive as a defensive end with more of a true nose tackle in the middle. So in other words, uh, where, where is, where, what's Benton's future um, moving forward? Is it more predominantly in base in the middle of that or can it be with him maybe serving as one of those guys in a three man front with another nose tackle next to him? I'm fine with him being a three, four nose tackle. I think it's a good role for him. I, I love the way that he's able to work over some of these smaller centers. Um, the, the, the question just becomes how much sub package does he get to play in your nickel? And it probably wasn't enough as a rookie. I know that, you know, once Haywood returned that occupied a spot and you paid Ogan Joby a bunch of money, but to me, the impact's less about the base stuff um, and more about just making sure he gets enough snaps as a nickel, uh, you know, three tech or one tech or whatever the, the front looks like. Right. Look, uh, you would like to see him use, you know, be- become some sort of a nickel type player. Uh, but until they get another nose tackle next to him, I mean, uh, you would like to see him become versatile and move up and down the line. Yeah, and he did that this past year when Haywood went down. He played, right. he kicked out and played some more end. Um, it, it depends on different variables. What do you have at nose tackle? What do you have at defensive end? Um, that that's going to impact maybe where they want to move and, and dabble with Benton at. But I, but bottom line is, I'm fine with him at nose tackle. I just want to make sure he gets a lot of consistent playing time as a sub package pass rusher. Ag- agreed, agreed. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Devin Beerley writes in, thanks for all your great work. Quick, quick question. I understand miles Garrett is elite, one of the best pass rushers in the league, but why do you think there seems to be a love affair with him and the media? He says the guy tried to bash in Mason Rudolph's head and then lied about it. Just wanted to get your thoughts. Devin, I don't think it's more of a, uh, I don't, I don't view it as a, a, a love affair with him and the media. I think, I think what you have seen happen uh, with them specifically is the impact of advanced analytics when it comes to win rates and pressure rates and uh, things outside of things on, uh, on, on the standard box score sheet. Uh, I don't, I think people, I mean, people will always remember that incident, you know, with, uh, Garrett will always be linked to that incident with Mason Rudolph and, and all that stuff. But, uh, I don't think that's, that's, that defines him obviously at this point in his career. Look, I mean, he's a, he's a, he's a very good player. He's one of the top, uh, pass rushers in the league. Uh, so I don't think it's, I don't think it's a love affair with him in the media. I just think that what you have seen happen and or happening over the last several years is the impact of advance metrics in the NFL, most notably uh, pro football focus. And that got the attention more of the the 50 uh, voters uh, more than anything. 
Yeah, I think I think that's a component of it. I think I think the award was kind of decided midseason because that's when Garrett was at his best. The Browns and their defense specifically were at their best, and that was kind of the determination. And just frankly, again, right or wrong, and my vote for DPOY would have been TJ Watt, but who had more viral moments this year? TJ Watt or Miles Garrett? It was Miles Garrett. He had the crossover basketball pre-snap play, which went viral. Everyone talked about. He had the delay a game against the Titans when they followed the tight ends around with him and, and forced a penalty. He had the leaping field goal block against the Colts, I think it was. I forget what team it was. Uh, he had those kind of big moments that, that everyone talked about, you know, on on Mondays. And that sticks in people's minds more than what was the most memorable play that TJ Watt made this year. I mean, he had made a ton of good ones for sure. Maybe the pick against the Rams, but I mean, Gary just had more viral moments. And for the media, that stuff matters. I mean, there were things of what that went viral, the sack without the helmet, and the, the, uh, the play, a uh, couple of plays against the Ravens in that first meeting. And obviously the, uh, the pick, if, if he, I, I do kind of, I, I, I get your point and I, it, it, it has several times I have kind of wondered what if he returns that for a touchdown in that game mm -hmm. against the Rams. Yeah. I, I wonder how much impact that has. Uh, here's the thing, you know, uh, you know, when you look at complete players as well, too, uh, I mean, what is asked to drop into coverage quite a bit, right? Sure. Uh, I got to pull the numbers for this year still, but it's around, they were doing it more towards the end of the year, maybe 10, 15% of the time. And who would you rather have on the field and run defense situations? Yeah, I take TJ Watt. Yeah, again, I'm not I'm not saying the winner should go to the guy who makes the viral plays. I'm just trying to think right. about from the media perspective what what sticks with them, what what remains with them. Right. And I think I think even JJ Watt made the comment a couple months ago about kind of get bored with the greatness of TJ Watt. Like it's just every year he's led the he's led the NFL in sacks in three of the last four seasons. The only exception was 2022 when he got hurt, missed half the year. So I think people just kind of go, okay, TJ Watt, bunch of sacks. They they shouldn't get bored of it. They should appreciate it, but they just kind of go, yeah, that's what TJ Watt does. Let's go give the award to somebody else. Had Watt had a few more, had, had Watt reset the, the, the sack record, would that have been enough for him? I think that's the only way. Well, I mean, the vote was very close, but I think, I think to me, the only way that TJ Watt would have won it was had he at least tied, but certainly if he had sat, set the sack record, he would have won the award. Cause at that point, it's almost, that becomes a viral moment. That becomes a historic talking point and that that's going to stick last in people's minds. And that would have given him, the edge again, the vote was very close. I mean, mm -hmm. Garrett only had four more first, first place votes on only 25 total points, um, more than Watt. So it was a closer battle than what I thought it was. And had Watt gotten to that point, let's say 23 sacks, yeah, he would have won it. Uh, thanks for that question. Uh, let's see, Scott. Uh, we'll end with this one from Scott says, Hey guys, given Tom Tomlin's end of year presser comments that there will be competition at quarterback. And he has in quotes here, we don't anoint anyone. He said, I would love to hear your thoughts on what that means. Practically speaking and what specifically will the decision be based on? Do you think there will be a real decision Tomlin will make for a week one starter based on performance in training camp preseason? Could it mean Tomlin may be more quick to bench? Kenny several games into the regular season. If his performance isn't up to expectation, assuming they re-sign Mason or bring in some mid-level veteran like a Tannehill, he says, I just don't see a scenario where Tomlin doesn't start Kenny week one. So basically my question is, what do you think it really means from a practical perspective that there will be a quarterback competition? He says the term gets thrown around a lot, but it's unclear to me. Uh, what what it really means and what it looks like. All right, uh, and we've kind of hit on this at you know kind of various points here. Uh, it feels like, and I and I use that loosely based on everything that we know, because heck, we don't even know who the backup quarterback is going <laughs> to be uh, uh, right. Uh, uh, right now. And I think deep down, the Steelers aren't one hundred percent sure uh, either. And I think if you roll back to the way the depth chart was uh used or not used or or however you want to frame with the whole Kenny Pickett remaining at one and uh hot hand and Mason and 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 the injury to Pickett yada yada it feels like they want 
they really would like Kenny Pickett to be the week one uh, starter as they sit here right now, regardless of what happens these next several weeks here at the, uh, in the, in the quarterback room. That's what it feels like they want to happen. Uh, now with, with cut with Tomlin and the, we don't anoint anyone. Is that just loose? That might be a ploy to try to attract somebody to come be the backup. A first, you know, there's so many layers to this that you could could especially someone like me, where you put on the tinfoil hat and, and go three levels way too deep, you know, uh, mm-hmm. which is a specialty of mine, uh, which oftentimes becomes meaningless thinking, but it's what I do. But uh, it, I, I'll just leave it at this. It feels like the Steelers want Kenny Pickett to be that week one starting starter in 2024. My hope is, though, that, they have a they make sure that the best quarterback wins the position there's whatever, no, whatever whatever that might look like there's no question they want Kenny Pickett to be the week one starter because they kind of need him to if not then who's your long-term quarterback option not on this roster because even if Tannehill or Rudolph becomes your week one starter probably not going to be your long-term guy at least in the franchise's eyes. Um, so, yeah, they, they certainly want Pickett to be the guy. What will the competition look like? It's a good question. I mean, listen, last time they, they called a quarterback competition in 2022, was there really a quarterback competition? No. Trubisky was going to be the guy, barring some sort of like implosion he had in the summer, and he didn't. He had a fine summer, and he became the week one starter. So we just had a whole quarterback competition framing that really didn't exist. And so will this be different? I think, I hope. But we'll have to see how it actually looks. Here's the thing: any push or or or, in other words, if 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 Alex Kazora comes out of training camp saying, "Uh, man, you know there there was really no, you know, clear winner here," it's going to go to Pickett. Yes, yes. Um, if, uh, if it's a tie or tie goes to Pickett, yes. And if you're a Steelers fan, that could be the worst thing that you hear. I mean, because what do you mean, of the, what do you mean by that? In other words, well, you know, there was no really clear winner here, and they're going with Pickett. You know, in other words, there wasn't uh, there wasn't enough to get hugely excited about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, from that standpoint, if it's just kind of stagnant, that's not what you're looking for. You need progression. You want to get excited. Although, of course, even a picket looks great. We're all going to say, "Ah, we had this conversation last right. year. Let's let's tamp things down." But of course, you want to see him do better than than just be you know okay. But I mean, they, I think they they want picket to play in 24 and use this as their final evaluation year to sit there and say, "Okay, new OC is in. Hopefully, some different talent around him. Sink or swim, Kenny Pickett. This is your year to figure it out." It really feels like that quote. Whatever comp. You know, we don't uh, we don't anoint anyone uh, uh, quarterback competition. It would have to be uh, decidingly landslided opposite Pickett for Pickett not to be the guy. Yeah, Pickett's not starting week one. Something went terribly wrong with Kenny Pickett. Either he got hurt or he just had a really miserable summer or maybe a Tannehill or whoever, you know, just just blew out of the water, but I, I think Pickett's still the odds on favorite. And they've said as much. They said Pickett is quarterback one. They're going to bring in competition and let him battle. But Pickett is right now the leader. And look, they're not going to go outside and, you know, uh, spend a huge amount of money or make any sort of uh, uh, high collateral uh, trade. Tra- you know, if you bring in somebody that's earning, you know, eight, nine, ten million dollars a year, you're probably not bringing or more. You're not bringing that guy in. Uh, to be a backup. And uh, conversely, if you, if you trade any collateral for anybody, especially, you know, the, the, no, I don't think it's going to happen with fields or anything, but if you went that way, even though salary wise, it's, it's, it, 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 it's not huge, but the decision with the fifth year option obviously would be then if you traded for a guy like fields or you traded for a guy like, 
I don't know who, who the next name would be on, on the list there. More than likely, that person is coming in to be the starter. But but we just mm-hmm. it would be surprising if it based on what Rooney has said and the what the, you're looking at this this organization from 30,000 feet right now, it'd be a surprise if anything like that happens. So long story short, it feels like Kenny Pickett's going to be your week one quarterback. Uh, and that kind of circles us back to where we kind of started this episode is for this for the Pittsburgh Steelers to 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 compete and not only win a playoff game but go for go far in the playoffs. It, it you, know, you got to have better. It's it's all about quarterback play. Sure, and that's precisely why they're not going to trade for Justin Fields because if they do, there's no competition. Fields is your starter. He's your guy. And maybe they should do that. You can debate that, but they're not going to do that because they want Pickett to have. They want Pickett to start. They want him to be the guy. They want him to turn things around. And if you go trade or go make a big splash for a quarterback, that goes out the window. And they're not willing or wanting to do that right now. Look, we're going to go several different areas throughout the rest of this offseason. Talk about draft. We're going to talk about free agency additions. uh, You know, that that sort of thing here. But the the overarching thing that we're going to continually talk about more than 20 times on this podcast is what's the quarterback play going to look like. And that will define their season or at least their postseason because they can make the playoffs with middling quarterback play. They can't win with middling quarterback play in the play in the playoffs. All right. So I got us all the way back to where we started on this show. So that's probably a good time to end this, right? Yeah. We'll be back on actually, how are we doing the podcast? Are we, I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe, you know, maybe we can record something late Tuesday night. Throw yeah, it up, I think, throw it up Wednesday. That sounds good. And then we'll I'll figure out Friday. I'll probably bring maybe I'll bring Josh on Friday. We'll, we'll talk Shrine Bowl or something. But we'll yeah, figure it out. And my, uh, another thing I thought about Tom Mead too. Maybe you could hmm. have uh, uh, kind of a separate roundtable with 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 Josh Carney and Tom Mead. Per- depending on, I, we don't know either one of their schedules right now, uh, there. And then on top of it, you know, we haven't. Uh, uh, Josh did the deep dive on. Uh, uh, Azani, Zach yeah, uh, uh, you know that that would give him an opportunity to to kind of go next level on him on 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 some of the stuff that he dug up. Okay, we'll play it by ear, but yeah, uh, we'll figure it out. But we'll, we'll have a show Wednesday and and take it from there. All right. Uh, in the meantime, you can follow me on Twitter slash X at Steeders Depot. Follow Alex at Alex underscore Kazora. Follow the show uh, at Terrible Podcast. Email the show, the Terrible Podcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do and want to donate to the cause, SteedersDepot.com. Hit the donate button up right, navigational bar. Uh, also, in that navigational bar, you will find an ad free uh, link that'll take you to an ad uh, way you can subscribe to an ad free version of the site for $25 for one uh, year from the time you sign up. Um, make sure to to look at that. Also, we will be you know, we got links in the navigational bar to the Senior Bowl and Shrine Bowl measurements. I think I need to add a link in there that uh, takes you to a uh, uh, summary page of all the draft profiles that are up on the site now, which I think is over fifty at this point. Here, guys, are really doing a good job on that. So, uh, anyway, back uh, with the show on Wednesday, and as always. Thanks for listening to the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex.